in the key.
No, no, just keep it there. Okay. Sure. Hello. Good evening. No. Thank you for coming. About, uh, we think, between us, 20 years ago, most of the people that you're going to see reading tonight um, auditioned for Masters production of A Christmas Carol, directed by Kathy Bundy, the previous owner of this establishment. And pretty much, other than Kathy dying in COVID, we've continued to do it. So um, tonight, you're just going to see a reading. We sort of have no budget, so this is what you get. <laughs> Free show. Um, and we have a special dedication tonight to uh, Dwayne Simmons, who was in many, many years. And all three of his children were in it. And um, I have to say that um, we are well represented by his surviving sons because they are stepping in, and you're going to see Zach tonight and Joey tomorrow doing um, the role that Dwayne did last year for us. And, and on that, to Dwayne and to um, the spirit of a Christmas carol because what a beautiful story. So thanks for coming. Day one, Marley's ghost. Marley was dead to begin with. There is no doubt what, what, whatever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it. And Scrooge's name was good upon change for anything he chose to put his hand to. Old Marley was dead as a doornail. Scrooge and he were partners for I don't know how many years. Scrooge was his sole executor, his sole administrator, his sole assigned, his sole residuary legatee, his sole friend, and sole mourner. And even Scrooge was not so dreadfully cut up by the sad event, but that he was an excellent man of business on the very day of his funeral and solemnized it with an undoubted bargain. There's no doubt that Marley was dead. This must be distinctly understood, or nothing wonderful can come of the story I'm about to relate. Scrooge never painted out old Marley's name. There it stood. Years afterwards, above the warehouse door, Scrooge and Marley. The firm was known as Scrooge and Marley. Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand at a grindstone. Scrooge, a squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner, hard and sharp as flint, from which no steel had ever struck out a generous fire, secret and self-contained and solitary as an oyster. The cold within him, within him froze his old features, nipped his pointed nose, shriveled his cheek, stiffened his gait, and made his eyes red, and thin lips blue, and spoke out shrewdly in his grating voice. Nobody ever stopped him in the street to say with gladsome looks, My dear Scrooge, how are you? When will you come to see me? But what did Scrooge care? It was, it was the very thing he liked, to edge his way along a crowded path of life, <laughs> warning all humans, sympathy to keep its distance. 
Once upon a time, of all the good days of the year, on Christmas Eve, old Scrooge sat busy in his counting house. It was cold, bleak, biting weather, foggy with all, and he could hear the people in the court outside go wheezing up and down, beating their hands upon their breasts and stomping their feet upon the pavement stones to warm them. The city clocks had only just struck, just gone three, but it was quite dark already. The door of Scrooge's counting house was open that he might keep an eye upon his clerk, who, in a dismal little cell beyond, a sort of tank, was copying letters. Scrooge had a very small fire, but the clerk's fire was so very much smaller that it looked like one coal. But he couldn't replenish it, for Scrooge kept the coal box in his own room. A Merry Christmas to you, Uncle. God save you. Bye, humbug. Christmas a humbug, Uncle. I'm sure you don't mean that. By Jew. Merry Christmas. What right have you to be merry? What reason have you to be merry? You're poor enough. Come then. What right have you to be dismal? What reason have you to be so morose? You're rich enough. Bah, humbug. Don't be cross, uncle. What else can I be, eh, when I live in a world of fools such as this? Merry Christmas. What's Christmas time to you but a time of paying bills without any money? A time for finding yourself a year older and not an hour richer. If I could work my will, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a steak of holly through his eye, he should. Uncle! Nephew, you keep Christmas in your own way, let me keep it in mine. Keep it, Uncle? But you don't keep it. Let me leave it alone, then. Much good it has ever done you. There are many things from which I have derived good by which I have not profited, I dare say. Uh. Christmas among the rest. But I am sure that I have always thought of Christmas time, when it's come round, as a good time. The only time of year that men and women seem to open their shut up hearts freely and think of people beneath them as fellow passengers to the grave and not some other race of creatures bound on other journeys. And therefore, uncle, though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe that it has done me good and will do me good. And I say, God bless it. You're quite a powerful speaker, sir. I wonder you don't go into Parliament. Don't be angry, Uncle. Come, dine with us tomorrow. I'd rather see myself dead than see myself with your family. But, but why? Why? Why did you get married? Because I fell in love. Ah! That, sir, is the only thing you have said to me in your entire lifetime, which is even more ridiculous than Merry Christmas. <laughs> Nay, Uncle. You never came to see me before I married, either. Why give it an excuse for not coming now? Good afternoon. I want nothing from you. I ask nothing of you. Why cannot we be friends? Good afternoon, nephew. I'm sorry with all my heart to find you so resolute. Mm -hmm. But I've made the trial an homage to Christmas, and I'll keep my Christmas humor to the last. So a Merry Christmas, Uncle. Good afternoon. And a Happy New Year. Good afternoon. <laughs> Uncle? You are the most... No, I shan't. My Christmas humor is intact. God bless you, Uncle. Uh, Merry Christmas, Bob Cratchit. Oh, Merry Christmas to you, oh, sir. Oh, finding a perfection, fire. just fine. To see the perfect pair of you, husbands with wives and children to support, my clerk they're earning 15 shillings a week, the perfect pair of you talking about a Merry Christmas. I'd retire to bed them. Fred left the office without an angry word, none but notwithstanding. Cratchit, in letting Scrooge's nephew out, had let two other people in. They had books and papers in their hands. Can I help you, gentlemen? Scrooge and Marley, Marley I believe. May I have the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Mr. Marley's been dead these seven years. He died seven years ago this very night. Oh, we have no doubt his liberality will be well represented by his surviving partner. Good afternoon. This will take but a moment, sir. At this festive time of the year, sir, it is more than usually desirable to make slight provisions for the poor and destitute who suffer greatly at this present time. Many thousands are in want of common necessities. Hundreds of thousands are in want of common comfort, sir. Are there no prisons? Oh, plenty of prisons. And aren't the union workhouses still in operation? Well, they are, still. I wish I could say that they are not. Oh, you see, uh, 
I thought from what you had said at first that something had occurred to stop them from their useful course. Glad to hear it. Under the impression that they scarcely provide Christian cheer of mind and body to the multitude, a few of us are endeavoring in raising a fund to buy the poor meat and drink and means of warmth. We choose this time because it is a time of all others when want is keenly felt and abundance rejoices. What shall I put you down for, sir? Nothing. Ah, you wish to remain anonymous? I wish to be left alone. <laughs> but since you asked me what I wish, that is my answer. I help to support the establishments which I have mentioned. They cost enough, and those who are badly off must go there. Many can't go there, and many would rather die. Well, if they would rather die, they had better do it to decrease the surplus population. <laughs> Besides, excuse me, I don't know that. But you might know it. No, it's not my business. It's enough for a man to understand his own business and not to interfere with other people's. Mine occupies me constantly. Good afternoon. Seeing clearly that it would be useless to pursue their point, the gentleman withdrew. Scrooge returned to his labors with an improved opinion of himself and in a more fastidious temper than was usual with him. A grocery boy stopped, stooped down at Scrooge's keyhole to regale him with a Christmas carol, but at the first sound of, God bless you, merry gentlemen, may nothing you dismay, Scrooge seized his ruler with such energy of action that the singer fled in terror. At length, the hour of shutting up and the counting house arrived. With an ill will, Scrooge dismounted from his stool and tacitly admitted the fact to his expectant clerk in the tank, who instantly snuffed out his candle and put on his hat. Well, you'll be wanting the whole day tomorrow, I suppose. If quite convenient, sir. Well, it's not convenient. And it's not fair. If I was to stop half a crown for it, you'd think yourself ill-used, I'll be bound. Uh, I don't know, sir. Yet you don't think me ill-used when I pay a day's wages for no work. It's only once a year. Poor excuse for picking a man's pocket on the 25th of December. I suppose you must have the whole day. Be here all the earlier next morning. Scrooge walked out <coughs> of the row. The office was closed in a twinkling, and the clerk ran home to Camden Town. Scrooge took his melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern, and then he went home to bed. Now, it is a fact. There was nothing in particular about the knocker at Scrooge's front door, except that it was a very large knocker. Scrooge, having his key in the lock of the door, saw in the knocker, without it undergoing any intermediate process of change, not the knocker, but Marley's face. It was not angry or ferocious, but looked at Scrooge as Marley used, used to look. The hair was curious, curiously stirred, as if by breath or hot air, and though the eyes were wide open, they were perfectly motionless. Scrooge looked fixedly at this phenomenon. It was an awkward day. He put his hand upon the key that he had relinqu relinquished, turned it sturdily, walked in, and lighted his candle. He fastened the door, walked across the hall, and up the stairs, slowly, too, trimming his candle as he went. Darkness is cheap, and Scrooge liked it. But before he shut his, he shut his heavy door, he walked through his rooms to see all was right. He had just enough recollection of the face to desire to do that. Quite satisfied, he closed the door and locked it himself. Locked himself in, double locked himself in, which was not his custom. Thus secured against the surprise, he looked off, took off his cravat, put on his dressing gown and his slippers and his nightcap, and sat down before the fire to take his gruel. Scrooge's glance happened upon happened to rest upon a bell, a disused bell that hung in the room and communicated for some purpose now forgotten with a chamber in the highest story of the building. It was with great astonishment and with great, strange, inexplicable dread that as he looked, he saw this bell begin to swing. It swung so softly in the outset that it scarcely made a sound, but soon it rang out loudly and so did every bell in the house. The bell ceased as they had begun, together. It was succeeded by a clanking, a clanking noise deep down below as if some person was dragging a heavy chain. The cellar door flew open with a booming sound and then we heard the noise much louder in the floors below, then coming up the stairs, then coming straight towards the door. It's humbug, said Scrooge. I won't believe it. 
His color changed, though, when without pause, it came on through the heavy door and passed into the room before his eyes. The same face, the very same, Marley in his pigtail. The chain he drew was clasped about his middle. It was long and wound about him like a tail, and it was made of cash boxes, keys, padlocks, ledgers, deeds, and heavy purses wrought in steel. Ooh. Ooh. Uh, Ooh. of me? Much. Who are you? Ask me who I was. Who were you then? In life, I was your business partner, Jacob Marley. You see, can you sit down? I can. Do it then. I shall. don't believe in me. I don't. Why do you doubt your senses? Because every little thing affects them. A, a slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheat. You may be an undigested bit of beef. <laughs> a blot of mustard. A crumb of cheese. A, a fragment of an underdone potato. <laughs> There's more of gravy than of grave about you, whatever you are. Come <laughs> on. I tell you, humbug. No! Mercy, dreadful apparition, mercy. Why, oh, why do you trouble me so? Man of the worldly mind, do you believe in me or not? Oh, I do, I must, but why do spirits such as you walk the earth, and why do they come to me? It is required of every man that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men and travel far and wide. And if that spirit <laughs> goes forth not in life, it is condemned to do so after death. I wear the chain I forged in life. I made it link by link and yard by yard. Is this pattern strange to you? Or would you know, you Scrooge, the weight and the length of the strong coil you bear yourself? It was full as heavy and as long as this. Seven Christmas Eves ago, you have labored on it since. It is a ponderous chain. Jacob, oh, Jacob Marley, tell me more. Speak comfort to me, Jacob. Ah, I have none to give. <laughs> comfort comes from other regions, Ebenezer Scrooge. It is conveyed by other ministers to other kinds of men. A very little more is all that is permitted to me. <laughs> I cannot rest, I cannot stay, I cannot linger anywhere. My spirit never walked beyond our counting house. <laughs> Mark me in life, my spirit never roved beyond the narrow limits of our money changing all and weary journeys lie before me. But you were always a good man of business, Jacob. Business! <laughs> Mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, benevolence, forbearance were all my business. Hear me, Ebenezer Scrooge, my time is nearly gone. I will, but don't be flowery, Jacob. Pray. Oh, how it is that I appear before you in a shape that I can see, I may not tell. I have sat invisible beside you for many and many a day. That is no light part of my penance. <laughs> uh. I am here tonight to warn you that you have got a chance to hope of escaping my fate, a chance and hope of my procuring Ebenezer. <laughs> you were always a good friend to me. Thank you. You will be haunted by three spirits. Would that be the chance and hope you mentioned, Jacob? It is. <laughs> I think I'd rather not. <laughs> Without their visits, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Expect the first one tomorrow when the bell tolls one. Couldn't I take them all at once and get it over, Jacob? <laughs> I expect the next one on the next night, the same hour, the third on the next, when the last stroke of twelve ceases to vibrate. Look to see me no more. And look that you remember 
what has passed between us. <laughs> the apparition walked backward from him, and at every step it took, the window raised itself a little, so that when the specter reached it, it was wide open. Marley's ghost floated out upon the bleak, dark night. Scrooge followed to the window, desperate in his curiosity. He looked out. The air was filled with phantoms wandering hither and thither in restless haste, moaning as they went. Every one of them wore chains like Marley's ghost. Some few were linked together, none that were free. Many had been personally known to Scrooge in their lives. He had been quite familiar with one old ghost who cried piteously at being unable to assist a wretched woman with an infant. The misery of them all was clearly that they sought to interfere for good in human matters and had lost the power forever. Whether these creatures faded into the mist or the mist enshrouded them, Scrooge could not tell, but they and their spirit voices faded together, and the night became as it had been when he walked home. Scrooge closed the window and examined the door by which the ghost had, in, had entered. It was double locked, and he had locked as he had locked it with his own hands, and the bolts were undisturbed. He tried to say humbug, but stopped at the first syllable, and being from the emotion he had undergone, or the fatigues of the day, or his glimpse of the invisible world, or the dull conversation of a ghost, or the lateness of the hour, much in need of repose, he went straight to bed without undressing and fell asleep upon the instant. slept through the whole day and far into another night. It isn't possible that anything has happened to the sun and it is twelve at noon. Scrooge scrambled out of bed and groped his way to the window. All he could make out was that it was still very foggy and extremely cold. Scrooge went to bed again and thought and thought and thought it over and over and could make nothing of it. Marley's ghost bothered him exceedingly. Was it a dream or not? Scrooge lay in this state until the chime had gone three quarters more, when he remembered, on a sudden, that the ghost had warned him of a visitation when the bell tolled one. He resolved to lie awake until the hour was past. The quarter was so long that he was more than once convinced he must have sunk into a doze unconsciously and missed the clock. At length, it broke upon his listening ear. The hour bell sounded with a deep, dull, hollow, melancholy, one. Light flashed up in the room upon the instant. The curtains of his bed were drawn aside, I tell you, by a hand. Scrooge, starting up into a half-recumbered attitude, found himself face to face with the unearthly visitor who drew them. It was a strange figure, like a child, yet not so like a child as like an old woman. Its hair was white, and is as if with age, and yet the face had not a wrinkle in it. It wore a tunic of the purest white, and round its waist was bound a lustrous belt. But the strangest thing about it was that from the crown of its head there sprung a bright, clear jet of light. Are you the spirit whose coming was foretold to me? I am. Who and what are you? 
pie and that goes to Christmas pies. Long pies? Oh no, your pies. Uh, may I ask, please, Spirit, what business you have here with me? Your welfare. Oh, not to sound ungrateful, Spirit, but really, kind Spirit, that I'm plenty obliged for your concern, but it would have done all the better for my welfare to have been left alone altogether to have slept peacefully through this night. Your reclamation, then. Take heed. My what? Come, fly with me. Fly? But I'm a mortal and cannot fly. Bear but a touch of my hand here, and you shall be upheld in more than this. Who? As the words were spoken, they passed through the town and stood upon an open country road with fields on either hand. The city had entirely vanished. The darkness and the mist had vanished with it, for it was a clear, cold winter day with snow upon the ground. Good heaven, I was, I was bred in this place. I was a boy here. I know it was trembling, Mr. Scrooge. And what is that upon your cheek? Upon my cheek? Nothing, a, a blemish in the skin from the eating of overmuch grease. Nothing. <laughs> kind spirit of Christmas past, lead me where you will, but quickly. To be stagnant in this place is for me unbearable. Will you recollect the way? Remember it. I, I would know it blindfolded. My bridge, my church, my winding river. These are but shadows of things that have been. They have no conscience of me. They have no consciousness of us. Well, it can be a pretty song. Oh, I do. I do. I know these men. I, I remember the beauty of their song. But why do you remember it so happily? It is Merry Christmas that they say to one another. What is Merry Christmas to you, Mr. Scrooge? Out upon Merry Christmas, right? What good has Merry Christmas ever done you, Mr. Scrooge? None. No good, nothing. Look me, sir, a school ahead. But the schoolroom is not quite deserted. A solitary child, neglected by his friends, is left there still. The school? A solitary child sits there. Look at him, Mr. Scrooge. I cannot look on him. You must, Mr. Scrooge. You must. It's me. Poor boy. He lived inside his head alone, poor boy. Oh, I wish. Oh, it's too late. What is the matter? Oh. There was a child singing a Christmas carol outside of my, my door last night. I should like to have given them something, that's all. Come, let us see another Christmas. Oh. Scrooge's former self grew larger at the words, and the room became a little darker and more dirty. There he was, alone again, when all the other boys had gone home for the jolly holidays. He was not reading now, but walking up and down despairingly. The door opened, and a little girl, much younger than the boy, came darting in, putting her arms about his neck and often kissing him. Dear, dear brother, I have come to take you home. Home, little fan? Yes. Home, for good and all. Father is so much kinder than he ever used to be, and home is like heaven. He spoke so gently to me one dear night when I was going to bed that I was not afraid to ask him once more if you might come home, and he said, yes, you should, and sent me in a coach to bring you, and you're to be a man and are never to come back here. But first, we're to be together all Christmas long and have the merriest time in the world. You are quite a woman, little fan. A terrible voice in the hall cried, Bring down Master Scrooge's box there. And in the hall appeared the schoolmaster himself, who glared on Master Scrooge with a ferocious condescension and threw him into a dreadful state of mind by shaking hands with him. Master Scrooge's trunk had by this time been tied onto the top of the chaise. The children bade the schoolmaster goodbye right willingly and getting into it, drove gaily down the garden sweep. Dear, dear little sister Fan, how I loved her. Always a delicate creature, whom a breath might have withered. She had a large heart. So she had. She died a woman, and had, as I think, children. Yes, one child. True, your nephew. Yes. Fine nephew, one, Mr. Scrooge. That warehouse over there. 
Do you know it? Know it? <laughs> Wasn't I apprenticed there? Well, well, bless my heart. It's Fezziwig, alive again. Quentin time! Yo ho! Ebenezer! Dick! to be sure, my fellow apprentice. He was very much attached to me, was Dick. Poor Dick, dear, dear. You know home, my boys. No more work tonight. It's Christmas Eve, Dick. It's Christmas, Ebenezer. Harry ho, let's clear this place away. Make plenty of room. Harry ho, Dick. Cheers, Ebenezer. In came a fiddler with a music book. In came Mrs. Fezziwig, one vast, substantial smile. In came the three Miss Fezziwig. Beaming and lovable. In came the six young followers who hearts their broke. In came all the young men and women employed in the business. There were dances and there was cake and there was a great piece of cold roast and plenty of beer. But the great effect of the evening came when the fiddler struck up to Roger de Coverley. Then old Fezziwig stood out to dance with Mrs. Fezziwig. When the clock struck eleven, this domestic ball broke up. Mr. and Mrs. Fezziwig took their stations, one on either side of the door, and shaking hands with every person individually as he or she went out, wished him or her a Merry Christmas. During the whole of this time, Scrooge had acted like a man out of his wits. His heart and soul were in the scene, and with his former self, he corroborated everything, remembered everything, enjoyed everything. It was a small matter that Fezziwig made those silly folks so full of gratitude. Small? Well, was it not a small matter, really? He spent but a few pounds of his mortal money on your small party. Well, three or four pounds, perhaps. Is that so much that he deserves such praise? Well, it isn't that. It isn't that spirit. Fezziwig had the power to make us happy or unhappy, to make our service light or burdensome, or pleasure or toil. The happiness he gave us quite as great as if it cost them a fortune. What is the matter? Oh, nothing particular. Oh, something, I think. No, no, I, I should like to be able to say a word or two to my clerk just now, that's all. My time grows short. Quick. Again, Scrooge saw himself. He was older now, a man in the prime of his life. His face had not the harsh and rigid lines of lady years, but it had begun to wear the signs of care and avarice. He was not alone, but sat by the side of a fair young girl in a mourning dress, in whose eyes there were tears which sparkled in the light. It matters little, to you very little, another idol has displaced me. What idol has displaced you? A golden one. This is an even-handed dealing of the world. There is nothing on which it is so hard as poverty and nothing it professes to condemn with such severity as the pursuit of wealth. You fear the world too much. Have you not seen your nobler, nobler aspirations fall off one by one until the master passion gain engrosses you? Have I not? What then? Even if I have grown so much wiser, what then? Have I changed towards you? No. <coughs> Our contract is an old one. It was made when we were both poor and content to be so. You were changed. When it was made, you were another man. I was a boy. Your own feelings tell, tells you that you were not what you are. I am. To which promised happiness when we were one in heart is, fraught with misery now that we are two. How often, how keenly I have thought of this, I will not say. It is enough that I have thought of it and can release you. Have I ever sought release? In words, no, never. In what then? It had changed nature, an altered spirit, and everything that made my love of any worth or value in your sight. If this has been, if this had never been between us, tell me, would you seek me out and try to win me now? No, I would gladly think otherwise if I could, heaven knows. But if you were free today, tomorrow, yesterday, can I even believe that you would choose a dowerless girl? You, who in your very confidence with her weigh everything by gain, or choosing her, do I, do I not know that your repentance and regret would surely follow? I do, and I release you with a full heart for the love of him you once were. You may, the memory of what is past hath makes me hope you will, have pain in this. A very, very brief time, and you will dismiss the memory of it as an unprofitable dream from which it happened while you awoke. May you be happy in the life that you have chosen. Your spirit, 
Show me no more. Conduct me home. Why do you torture me so? One shadow more. No, no more, no more. I, I don't want to see it. Show me no more. But the relentless ghost pinioned Scrooge in both his arms and forced him to observe what happened next. They were in another scene and place, a room not very large or handsome, but full of comfort. Near to the winter fire sat a beautiful young girl, so like that last that Scrooge believed it was the same until he saw her, now a comely matron, sitting opposite her daughter. The noise in this room was perfectly tumultuous, for there were more children than Scrooge, in his agitated state of mind, could count. The mother and daughter laughed heartily and enjoyed it very much. But now a knocking at the door was heard, and such a rush immediately ensued, just in time to greet the father, who came home attended by a man laden with Christmas toys and presents. Then the struggling and the onslaught that was made on the defenseless porter. The shouts of wonder and delight with which the development of every package was received. The joy and gratitude and ecstasy. They are all indescribable alike. And now, Scrooge looked on more attentively than ever when the master of the house, having his daughter leaning fondly on him, sat down with her and her mother at his own fireside. And when Scrooge thought that such another creature, quite as graceful and as full of promise, might have called him father, and could, could have been a springtime in the haggard winter of his life, his sight grew very dim indeed. Well, I saw an old friend of yours this afternoon. And who was it? Yes. How can I? <laughs> Do I know? Mr. Scrooge it was. I passed by his office open window and it was not shut up. I had a candle inside and I could scarcely stop seeing him. His partner was upon the point of death, I hear. And there he sat, alone. Quite alone in the world, I do believe. Spirit, remove me from this place. I have told you. These were shadows of things that have been. They are what they are. Do not blame me, Mr. No, remove me. I can't bear it. Take me back. Haunt me no longer. Scrooge was conscious of being exhausted and overcome by an irresistible drowsiness, and further, of being in his own bedroom. He barely had time to reel to bed before he sank into a heavy sleep. <laughs>
it was his own room, there was no doubt about that, but it had undergone a surprising transformation. <laughs> the walls and ceilings were so hung with living green that it looked like a perfect grove. The crisp leaves of holly, mistletoe, and ivy reflected the light. Heaped up on the floor to form a kind of a throne were turkeys, geese, game, poultry, long wreaths of sausages, mince pies, and plum puddings. In easy state upon this couch there sat a jolly giant, glorious to see, who wore a glowing torch and shape, unlike Clancy's horn. <laughs> come in, come in, and know me better, man. Hello, how should I call you? <laughs> I am the ghost of Christmas present. Look upon me. You have never seen the like of me before? Never. You have never walked forth with younger members of my family? My elder brothers born on Christmas's past? I don't think I have. I'm afraid I've not. Have you had many brothers? <laughs> Over 1,800. <laughs> Tremendous family to provide for. A spirit, lead me where you will. I went forth last night on compulsion and learned a lesson which is working now. Tonight, if you would like to teach me, let me profit by it. Touch my robe. Scrooge did as he was told and held it fast. The room vanished instantly, and they stood in the city streets on a Christmas morning where the people made a rough kind of music in scraping the snow from the pavement in front of their dwellings. The poulterers' shops were still half open and the pruderers were radiant in their glory. Soon the staples called good people all to church and chapel and away they came, walking through the streets in their best clothes and with their gayest faces. At the same time, there emerged from scores of by streets innumerable people carrying the dinners to the baker shop. The sight of these poor revelers appeared to interest the spirit very much, for he stood with Scrooge beside him in a baker's doorway, and taking off the covers as the bearers passed, sprinkled incense on the dinners from his torch. Once or twice, when, when there were angry words between some dinner carriers who had jostled each other, he shed a few drops of water on them and their good humor was restored directly, for they said it was a shame to quarrel on Christmas Day. <coughs> they went on, invisible as they had before, into the suburbs of the town. The good spirit led him straight to Scrooge's clerks. On the threshold of the door, the spirit smiled and stopped to bless Bob Cratchit's dwelling with the sprinkling of his torch. Then, up rose Mrs. Cratchit, dressed out, but poorly in a twice-turned gown, assisted by Belinda Cratchit, second of her daughters, while Master Peter Cratchit plunged the fork into a saucepan of potatoes. And now, two smaller Cratchits, a boy and a girl, came tearing in, screaming that outside the bakers they had smelt the goose and noted for their own, and basking in luxurious thoughts of sage and onion these young Cratchits danced about the table and exalted Master Peter Cratchit to the skies while he blew the fire until the slow potatoes, bubbling up, knocked loudly at the saucepan lid to be let out and peeled. Whatever has got your precious father then, and your brother, Tiny Tim, and Martha weren't late last year. Christmas by half an hour. Here's Martha, Mother. It's Martha, Mother. Here's Martha. Hurrah! There's such a goose, Martha. Why, bless your heart alive, my dear. How late you are. We had a deal of work to finish up last night and had to clear away this morning, Mother. Well, never mind. So long as you are calm, sit ye down before the fire, my dear, and have a warm. Lord bless you. No, no. There's Father coming. Hide, Martha, hide! Why, where's our Martha? Not coming. Not coming? Not coming upon Christmas Day? Oh, poor Father, don't be disappointed. What's this? It is I. Martha. Martha, Martha! Tiny Tim! Come, brother. You must hear the pudding singing in the copper. Pudding? What flavor have we? Plum! Plum! Oh, Mother, I love plum! And how did little Tim behave? As good 
is gold and even better. Somehow he gets thoughtful sitting there by himself so much and thinks the strangest things you have ever heard. He told me coming home that he hoped people saw him in church because he was a cripple. And it might be pleasant for them to remember upon Christmas Day who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. He has the oddest ideas sometimes, but he seems all the while to be growing stronger and more hearty. One would never know. Tiny Jim's active little crutch was heard upon the floor and back he came before another word was spoken, escorted by his brother and sister to the stool before the fire. Master Peter and the two young Cratchits went to fetch the goose, with which they soon returned in high procession. Such a bustle ensued that you might have thought a goose was the rarest of all birds. Bob took Tiny Jim beside him in a tiny corner at the table. The two young Cratchits set chairs for everybody, and at last the dishes were set on and Grace was set. It was succeeded by a breathless pause as Mrs. Cratchit, looking slowly all along the carving knife, prepared to plunge it in the breast. But when she did, and when the long expected gush of stuffing issued forth, one murmur of delight arose all around the board, and even Tiny Tim, excited by the two young Cratchits, beat on the table with the handle of his knife and feebly cried, Hurrah! There never was such a goose. Bob said he didn't believe there ever was such a goose cooked. Eked out by applesauce and mashed potatoes, it was a sufficient dinner for the whole family. Mrs. Cratchit left the room alone to take the pudding up and bring it in. Oh, what a wonderful pudding. Bob Cratchit said he regarded it as the greatest success achieved by Mrs. Cratchit since their marriage. At last, the dinner was done, and the Cratchit family drew round the hearth. A Merry Christmas to us, my dear. God bless us. Merry Christmas. God bless us. God bless us, everyone. Spirit, tell me if Tiny Tim will live. I see a vacant seat in the poor chimney corner, and a crutch without an owner, carefully preserved. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, None other of my race will find him here. What then? If he be like to die, he had better do it and decrease the surplus population. Oh. Mr. Scrooge, I'll give you Mr. Scrooge, the founder of this feast. The founder of the feast, indeed. I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast upon, and I hope he'd have a good appetite for it. My dear, the children. It's Christmas Day. It should be Christmas Day, I am sure, on which one drinks the health of such an odious, stingy, unfeeling man as Mr. Scrooge. You know he is, Robert. Nobody knows it better than you do, poor fellow. My dear, Christmas Day. Drink to his health for your sake and the day's, not for his sake. A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. He'll be very merry and very happy, I have no doubt. The children drank the toast after her. It was the first of the proceedings which had no heartiness. <coughs> by and by, they have a song about a lost child traveling in the snow from Tiny Tim, who had a plaintive little voice and sang it very well indeed. There was nothing of high mark in this. They were not a handsome family. They were not well dressed. Their show, shoes were far from being waterproof. Their clothes were scanty. But, but they were happy, grateful, pleased with one another, and contented with the time. And when they faded and looked happier yet in the bright sprinkling of the spirit's torch at parting, Scrooge had his eye upon them and especially on Tiny Tim, until the last. By this time, it was getting dark and snowing pretty heavily as Scrooge and the Spirit went along the streets. It was a great surprise to Scrooge, while listening to the moaning of the wind, to hear a hearty laugh. It was a much greater surprise to Scrooge to recognize it 
as his own nephews and to find himself in a bright, dry, gleamy room with the spirit standing smiling by his side and looking at that same nephew with approving affability. It strikes me as so funny to think of what he said, that Christmas was a humbug. As I live, he believed it. More shame for him, Fred. Well, he's a comical old fellow, that's the truth. I have no patience with him. Oh, I have. I'm sorry for him. I couldn't be angry with him if I tried. Who suffers by his ill whims? Himself, always. It's me they talk of, isn't it, spirit? Here, wife, consider this. Uncle Scrooge takes it into his head to dislike us and won't come dine with us. What's the consequence? Oh, you're sweet to say what I think you're about to say, Fred. What's the consequence? He doesn't lose much of a dinner by it, I can tell you that. Oh, Fred, indeed. I think he loses a very good dinner. Ask my sisters or your bachelor friend Topper. Ask any of them. They'll tell you what, what old Uncle Scrooge missed, a dandy meal. Well, that's something of a relief, wife. Glad to hear it. The truth is, he misses much, yet I mean to give him the same chance every year whether he likes it or not. For I pity him. Nay, he is my only uncle, and I feel for the old miser. I tell you, wife, I see my dear and perfect mother's face on his own wizened cheeks and brow. Brother and sister they were, and I cannot erase that from each view of him I take. I understand what you say, Fred, and I am with you in your yearly asking, but he, will, he never will accept you, no, he never will. Well, true wife, uncle may rail at Christmas till he dies. I think I shook him some with my visit yesterday. I refused to go grow angry no matter how nasty he became. And it was he who grew angry, wife. <laughs> what he says is true, spirit. Bah humbug! Oh. <laughs> there is much laughter in our marriage, wife. It pleases me. You please me. And you please me, Fred. You are a good man. Come now, we must have a look at the, our meal. Our guests will arrive soon. My sisters, Topper. A toast first. A toast to Uncle Scrooge. A toast to him? Uncle Scrooge has given us plenty of merriment, I am sure, and it would be ungrateful to not drink to his health. And I say, Uncle Scrooge. <laughs> You're a proper loon, Fred, and I'm a proper wife to you. Uncle Scrooge. Spirit, please make me visible, make me audible. I, I want to talk with my nephew and my niece. These shadows are gone from you now, Mr. Scrooge. You may return to them later in your dreams. My time grows short, Ebenezer Scrooge. Look you on me. Do you see how I've aged? Well, your, your hair has gone gray, your skin wrinkled, your spirit life so short. My stay upon this globe is brief, very brief. It ends tonight. Tonight? At midnight. The time is drawing near. Hear those chimes? In a quarter hour, my life will have been spent. Look, Scrooge, man, you look you here. From the foldings of its robe, it brought out two children, wretched, abject, frightful, hideous, miserable. They knelt down at its feet and clung to the outside of its garment. They were a boy and a girl, yellow, meager, ragged, scowling, wolfish, but prostrate, too, in their humility. Who are they? They are man's children, and they cling to me, appealing from their fathers. The boy is ignorance, the girl is want. Beware of them both, and all their degree. But most of all, beware of this boy, for I see that written on his brow is doom, unless the written be erased. Oh, have they no resource or refuge? Are there no prisons? Are there no workhouses? Uh, no. Are there no prisons? No. Are there no workhouses? Are there no prisons? No. Are there no workhouses? The bell struck twelve. Scrooge looked upon him, about him, for the ghost and saw it not. As the last stroke ceased to vibrate, he remembered the prediction of old Jacob Marley, and lifting up his eyes, he held a solemn phantom, draped and hooded, coming like a mist along the ground towards him.
upon his knee, for in the very air through which this spirit moved, it seemed to scatter gloom and mystery. It was shrouded in a deep black garment, which concealed its head, its face, its form, and left nothing of it visible save one outstretched hand. <coughs> Who are you, Phantom? Oh, yes, I think I know you. You are, are you not, the spirit of Christmas yet to come? And you are about to show me the shadows of things that have not happened, but will happen in time before us. Is that not so, spirit? Oh, ghost of the future, I fear you more than any specter I have seen, but as I know that your purpose is to do me good, and as I hope to live to be another man from what I was, I am prepared to bear you company. Lead on, then. Lead on. The night is waning fast, and it is precious time to me, so lead on, spirit. The phantom moved away as it had come towards him. Scrooge followed in the shadow of its dress, which bore him up. He thought and carried him along. They scarcely seemed to enter the city, but there they were in the heart of it. The spirit stopped beside one little knot of businessmen. Observing that the hand was pointed to them, Scrooge advanced to listen to their talk. No, I don't know much about it either way. I only know that he's dead. When did he die? Last night, I believe. Why? What was the matter with him? God knows. What has he done with his money? I haven't heard. Have you? I left it to his company, perhaps. Money to money. You know the uh, expression. Hasn't left it to me. That's all I know. Nor to me. You then. You have his money? Me? Me? His money? No. <laughs> it's likely to be a cheap funeral. For upon my life, I don't know a living soul who'd care to venture to it. Suppose we make up a party and volunteer. I don't mind going if a lunch is provided, but I must be fed if I make one. Well, I'm the most disinterested among you, for I never wear black gloves and I never eat lunch. But I'll offer to go if anybody else will. When I come to think of it, I'm not sure that I wasn't his most particular friend, for I used to stop and speak whenever we met. Well. Bye-bye. 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 <laughs> Scrooge was at first inclined to be surprised that the spirit should attach importance, conversation apparently so trivial. But feeling assured that they must have some hidden purpose, he set himself to consider what it was likely to be. They could scarcely be supposed to have any bearing on the death of Jacob, his old partner, for that was past. And this ghost province was the future. Scrooge had an expectation that the conduct of his future self would give him a clue what he missed. He looked about in that very place for his own image, but another man stood in his accustomed corner, and though the clock pointed to his usual time of day for being there, he saw no likeness of himself among the multitudes. They left the busy scene and went to an obscure part of the town where Scrooge had never penetrated before. Although he recognized its situation and its bad repute, far in this den of infamous resort, there was a low browed beetling shop, sitting in among the wares he dealt in by a charcoal stove, was a gray-haired rascal, nearly 70 years of age, spoke in his pipe in all the luxury of calm retirement. Scrooge and the Phantom came into the presence of this man, just as a woman with a heavy bundle slunk into the shop. But she had scarcely entered when another woman, similarly laden, came in too. And she was closely followed by a woman in faded black who was no less startled by the sight of them than they had been upon their recognition of each other. Look here, old Joe, here's a chance. All three of us meeting, we hadn't even met it. You could have met in a better place. Come into the parlor. You were made free of it long ago, you know. The other two ain't strangers. We're all suitable to her calling. We're well matched. Come into the parlor. Come into the parlor. Ah, oh, what odds, then? What odds, Mrs. Dilber? Every person has the right to take care of himself. He always did. That's true. No man more so. Why, then, don't stand staring as if you were afraid, woman. Who's the wiser? 
We aren't going to pick holes in each other's coats, I suppose. No, indeed. Mm, very soon. I hope not. Oh, that's enough. Very. Who's the wiser for the loss of a few things such as these? Not a dead man, I suppose. <laughs> no, indeed. <laughs> if he wanted to keep him after he was dead, the wicked old screw, why wasn't he more natural in his lifetime? If he had been, he'd have had someone to look after him when death struck, instead of lying or gasping alone. <coughs> Truer word was never spoken. Means of judgment on him. I wish it were a heavier one. And it would have been, you can depend on it, if I could have laid my hand on anything else. Look in my bank, Joe, and give me its value. Uh, speak out plainly. I'm not afraid to go first, to hear them, to see it. We all knew pretty well that we were going to collect things, I believe. It's no sin. Go on, Joe. No, 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 my dear. I wouldn't think of letting you be the first to show what you've earned from all this. I throw in mine. It's not real expensive, see? Seals, a pencil case, sleeve buttons. Nice Ooh. sleeve buttons, though. Not bad, not bad. There's a brooch there. Ooh. Not really valuable, I'm afraid. <laughs> Oh, Joe, Joe. Uh, a pitiful lot, really. A ten and six, and not a sixpence more. Oh, no, serious. That's your account, and I wouldn't give another sixpence if I was to be boiled for not doing it. Oh. Uh, who's next? Me. Sheets, towels, silver spoons, Ooh. silver sugar tongs, nice. some boots. Oh. Well, I always give too much to the ladies. Uh, it's a weakness of mine, and that's the way I ruin myself. Uh, here's your total coming up. Uh, two pounds ten. If you asked me for another penny and made it an open question, I'd repent of being so liberal and knock off half a crown. Oh. Open my bundle, Joe. Uh, so many knots, madam. Do you call this bed curtains? Oh, yes, bed curtains. You mean to say you took them down rings and all with him lying there? Oh, well, yes, I did. Why not? <laughs> you were born to make your fortune. And you'll certainly do it. Well, I shan't hold my hand when I can put something in it for the sake of such a man as he was, Joe. Uh, don't get any lamp oil on those blankets now. His blankets? What? Whose else do you think? <laughs> he shan't kill cold without them, I <laughs> dare say. Well, I hope you don't die even in catching, eh? Oh, <laughs> you don't have to worry about that. I ain't so fond of his company that I'd loiter about about for things if I thought he did. You can look at that shirt until your eyes ache. You won't find a hole nor a threadbare place in it. It's a fine one, the best he had. It would have been ruined if it hadn't been for me. What do you mean, they'd have wasted it? What? Putting it on him to be buried in for sure. <laughs> Somebody was fool enough to do it, but I took it off again. <laughs> it, it Caterco ain't good enough for something like that. It isn't good enough for anything. It's quite becoming to the body. <laughs> and he can't look any uglier than he did in that. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Uh, one pound six for the lot. Uh, that's the end of it, you see. He frightened everyone away from him who, while he was alive to profit us when he was dead. <laughs> <laughs> I see it, I see it. This unhappy man, this stripped bare corpse, could very well be my own. My life tends that way now. Scrooge recoiled in terror, for the scene had changed, and now he almost touched a bed, a bare, uncurtained bed on which beneath a ragged sheet, there lay someone covered up. The room was very dark, too dark to be observed with any accuracy, though Scrooge glanced round in an obedience to a secret impulse, anxious to know what kind of room it was. A pale light, rising in the outer air, fell straight upon the bed, and on it, plundered and bereft, unwatched, unwept, uncared for, was the body of this man. Scrooge glanced towards the phantom. Its steady hand was pointed to the head. The cover was so carelessly adjusted that the slightest raising of it, the motion of a finger, finger upon Scrooge's part, would have disclosed the face. He thought of it, felt how easy it would be to do, and longed to 
do it, but had no more power to withdraw the veil than to dismiss the specter at his side. In spirit, this is a fearful place, and leaving it, and I shall not leave its lessons. Trust me, let us go. If there's anyone in town who is emotions are moved by this man's death, show me that person. I beseech you, spirit. The phantom spread its dark robe before him for a moment, like a wing, and withdrawing it, revealed a room by daylight where a mother and her children were. She was expecting someone with anxious eagerness, for she walked up and down the room, startled at every sound, looked out from the window, glanced at the clock, tried, but in vain, to work with her needle, and could hardly bear the voices of the children in their play. At length, the long-expected knock was heard. She hurried to the door and met her husband, a man whose face was careworn and depressed, though he was young. He sat down to the dinner that had been boarded for him by the fire, and when she asked him faintly what news, he appeared embarrassed how to answer. Is it good or bad? Not bad. Oh, we are indeed ruined! No, no, there is hope yet, Caroline. There is, if he relents, there is, there is always hope, I suppose, if a miracle has happened. Well, he is past relenting. He is dead. But that half-drunken woman whom I told you of last night said to me when I tried to see him, obtain a week's delay. And what I thought was a mere excuse to avoid me, turns out to have been quite true. He was not only very ill, but dying then. To whom shall our debt be transferred? I, I, I don't know, but before that time, we should be ready with the money. And even though we're, we were not, it would be a bad fortune indeed to find so merciless a creditor in his successor. We may sleep well tonight with light hearts, Caroline. Yes, their hearts were lighter. It was a happier house for this man's death. The only emotion that the ghost could show him caused by the event was one of pleasure. Let me see some tenderness connected with the death of that dark chamber spirit which we just left now will be forever present to me. The ghost conducted him through several streets familiar to his feet. And as they went along, Scrooge looked here and there to find himself. But nowhere was he to be seen. They entered poor Bob Cratchit's house, the dwelling he had visited before, and found the mother and the children seated around the fire. Quiet, very quiet. The noisy little Cratchits were as still as statues in one corner. The mother and her daughters were engaged in sewing, but surely they were very quiet. The color hurts. want to show your father weak eyes when he comes home. Not for the world. Oh, must be near his son. Past it, rather. But I think he's been walking a bit slower than usual these last few evenings, Mother. I have known him to walk with... I have known him to walk with Tiny Tim upon his shoulder, and very fast indeed. So have I, Mother. father loved him so that it was no trouble, no trouble. And there's your father at the door. Father! Hello, wife, children. How good to see you all. And look at this sewing. I have no doubt with all your industry, we'll have quite a quilt to sit down upon our knees in church on Sunday. You made arrangements today then, Robert, for the service to be on Sunday? The funeral. Oh, well, yes. Yes, I did. I wish you could have gone. It would have done you good to see how green a place it is, but you'll see it often. I promised him that I would walk there on a Sunday. My little, little child. My little, little child. Oh, Father. Forgive me. I, I saw Mr. Scrooge's nephew, and he was so wonderful to me, wife. He is the most pleasant-spoken gentleman I have ever met. He said, 
I am heartily sorry for it, Mr. Patchett, and heartily sorry for you, good wife. If I can be of service to you in any way, here's where I live. And he gave me this card. Let me see it. And he looked me straight in the eye, wife, and said meaningfully, I pray you'll come see me, Mr. Patchett, if you need some help. I pray you do. Now, if it wasn't for the sake of anything that he might be able to do for us, so much as for his kind way, it seemed as if he had known of Tiny Tim and felt him with us. But I'm sure he's a good soul. You would be sure of it, my dear. If you saw and spoke to him, I shouldn't be at all surprised if he got Peter a situation. I hear that, Peter. And then Peter will be keeping company with someone and setting up for himself. Get along, Peter. It's just as likely as not one of these days, though there's plenty of time for it, my dear. But however and whenever we part from one another, I am sure we shall none of us forget the poor tiny Tim, shall we? Our first parting that we are among us. Never, Father. And when we recollect how patient and mild he was, we shall not quarrel easily among ourselves and forget tiny, tiny Tim in doing it. No, Father, never. Inspector, something informs me that our parting moment is at hand. I. I know it, but I know not how I know it. Tell me what man that was whom we saw lying dead. Scrooge joined the phantom once again, and wondering why and whither he had gone, accompanied it until they reached an iron gate, a churchyard. Here then, the wretched man whose name he had now to learn lay underneath the ground. The spirit stood among the graves and pointed down to one. Scrooge advanced towards it, trembling. The phantom was exactly as it had been, but Scrooge dreaded that he saw a new meaning in a solemn shape. Before I draw near to that stone to which you point, answer me one question. <clears throat> are these the shadows of things that will happen, or, 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 or they, they just may happen in time before our spirit? Still the ghost pointed downward to the grave by which it stood. <coughs> Scrooge crept towards it, trembling as he went, and following the finger, read upon the stone of the neglected grave his own name, Ebenezer Scrooge. Oh, spirit, oh no. Spirit, spirit, hear me. I am not the man I was. I will not be the man I would have been but for this intercourse. Why show me this if I am past all hope? Oh, good spirit, I see by your wavering hand that your good nature intercedes for me and pities me. Assure me that I yet may change these shadows you have shown me by an altered life. I will honor Christmas in my heart and try to keep it all the year. I will live in the past, the present, and the future. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. Tell me that I may sponge away the writing that is upon this stone. In his agony, he caught the spectral hand. It sought to free itself, but he was strong in his entreaty and detained it. The spirit, stronger yet, repulsed him, holding up his hands in a last prayer to have his fate reverse. Scrooge saw an alteration in the phantom's hood and dress. It shrunk, collapsed and dwindled down into a bedpost. <laughs> his own. The bed was his own. The room was his own. Best and happiest of all, the time before him was his own to make amends in. Oh, I will live in the past, the present, and the future. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. Oh, Jacob, Jacob Miley, I, 
I praise you for this. I praise you in heaven and Christmas time. I, I say it to you in my knees, oh, chase up on my knees. Not torn down. My bed curtains are not at all torn down. Rings are all. They are here. Here they are. <laughs> I am here. <laughs> <laughs> The shine of the things that would have been may now be dispelled. They will be, Jacob. I know they will. Oh, 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 oh. oh I'm, I'm light as a feather. I'm as happy as an angel. I'm as mad as a schoolboy. Merry Christmas to everybody. Merry Christmas to everybody. A happy New Year to all the world. Hello here. Whoa. Why, oh, I don't know what day of the month it is. <laughs> I don't care. I, I don't care a fig. I, I don't know anything. I, I'm quite a baby. I, I don't care. I, I'd much rather be a baby than be an old wreck like me or Molly. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Hey, you boy. What's today? Today, sir? Why, it's Christmas Day. Oh, it's Christmas Day, is it? Why, well, I haven't missed it after all, have I? Why, the spirits did all they did in one day. Well, they can do anything they may like, right? Of course they can. Of course they can. Excuse me, sir? Oh, oh yes. Uh, uh, do you know the poulterers in the next street but one at the corner? I should hope so, sir. Oh, intelligent boy. Remarkable lad. Do you know whether the poulters have sold the prize turkey that was hanging up there? Oh, I don't mean the little prize turkey. I mean the big one. Do you mean the one that's as big as me? I mean the turkey that sizes you. That's the bird. It's hanging there now, sir. Oh, it is. Uh, go and buy it. Uh, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm absolutely in earnest. Go and buy it and have them bring it here so that I might give them directions where I want it delivered as a gift. Come back here with the van and I'll give you a shilling. Come back here with them in less than five minutes and I'll give you half a crown. The blur is off of a shot. Oh. 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 I'll send it to Bob Cratchit. He won't know who sends him this. Oh, oh that turkey is twice the size of Tiny Tim. Oh. The hand in which he wrote the address was not a steady one, but write it he did somehow, and went downstairs to open the street door, ready for the coming of the poulterer's man. As he stood there, waiting his arrival, the door knocker caught his eye. Whew. What a beautiful door knocker. I'll remember it for the rest of my life. I, I scarcely noticed it before. Oh, 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 it was a turkey. He never could have stood upon his legs, that bird. He would have snapped them short off in a minute like sticks of sealing wax. The chuckle with which he thought this, and the chuckle with which he paid for the turkey, and the chuckle with which he paid for the cab, and the chuckle with which he recompensed the boy, were only to be exceeded by the chuckle with which he sat down breathless in his chair again, and chuckled till he cried. Oh. Oh, oh. He dressed himself all in his best, and at last got out into the streets. The people were by this time pouring forth, as he had seen them with the ghosts of Christmas present. Scrooge regarded everyone with a delighted smile. He looked so irresistibly pleasant, in a word, that three or four good-humored fellows said, Good morning, sir, a Merry Christmas to you! And Scrooge said often afterwards that of all the blithe sounds he had ever heard, those were the blithest in his ears. He had not gone far when coming on towards him, he beheld the portly gentleman who had walked into his counting house the day before and said, Scrooge and Marley's, I believe. It sent a pang across his heart to think how this old gentleman would look upon him when they met. But he knew what path lay straight before him, and he took. Oh, dear sir, how do you do? I do hope you succeeded yesterday. It was very kind of you. Uh, uh, Merry Christmas. M M Mr. Scrooge? Yes, Scrooge is my name, but I, you may not find it very pleasant. Allow me to ask your pardon, and will you have the goodness to... 
Lord bless me, my dear Mr. Scooch, are you serious? If you please, not a farthing less. And a great many back payments are included in it. Will you do me that favor? Uh, I will, I will. I don't know what to say to such a man. Don't Mr. say anything, please. Come and see me, will you? I will. I will. Uh, I will. It'll be my pleasure. Thank you. Much obliged. Bless you. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Scrooge went to church and walked about the streets and watched the people hurrying to and fro and patted children on the head and questioned beggars and looked down into the kitchens of houses and up to the windows and found that everything could yield him pleasure. He had never dreamed that any walk, that anything could give him so much happiness. In the afternoon, he turned his steps toward his nephew's house. He passed the door a dozen times before he had the courage to go up and knock. But he made a dash, and he did it. Thank you. Bathroom's open. <laughs> 